no other religion on the face of the earth that has singers like God's people. We are the only people that have something to sing about. Thank God for that. Joyful music. They shall come into Zion with gladness and joy and singing and everlasting joy upon their heads. A good knowledge of God. There is considerable in the Word of God about the knowledge of God. Every time you read about it, it's a key subject. It's fundamental. It's never a sideline. Never a secondary consideration. God at one time indicted the Gentile world because it refused to retain God in their knowledge. It's found in Romans 1.28. It was more than just an outburst of anger that God said this. It was a lament. The Jewish people who were custodians of all the promises and the glory and the service and the covenants and the law. As a matter of fact, from them the Savior himself came. They proved to be a dismal failure also in this respect. Romans the second chapter tells us that they made their boast of God. They knew God knew his will and were expert in spiritual things, but they didn't know God either. So God spanned the entire panorama of the human race and his heart lamented as he cried out and said, there is none that understands. There is none that knows. I wasn't talking about a knowledge of the sciences of the earth, expertise in all of the philosophies of men, or comprehension of personal abilities and liabilities. That would not cause God to lament. God lamented because his own offspring were unfamiliar with him. They didn't know him. They have not known me. Oh, he would lament over the nation of Israel. I have surnamed thee, he said, and yet thou hast not known me. You have sought out to me a heart of You have departed from me. Thou hast not known me. Over and over, he indicted his people. Thank God that now a time has come when God can be known. Now there are three principles I want to develop. I'll just summarize them down into three points. First of all, God has created man so that man can know God. Now, you must see that. There's no point in talking about the knowledge of God if nobody can know it. Man has a nature capable of knowing and understanding God. Secondly, God has revealed himself so that he can be understood. Amen. In fact, apart from this, there's no reason for revelation. And thirdly, God desires that men know him. He wants this. So all of you know that man bears the stamp of divine imagery. God struck upon the human enterprise of I may speak as a man and said, let us make man in our own image. So the scripture says, after his own image created, he then, male and female created, he them and called their name Adam. The human enterprise was lost with a personality that bore a mark of divine imagery. He could will, he could purpose, he could reason, he had the capacity to converse with God, to comprehend God, to hear and work with God. He could in fact labor with God. What an enterprise this was. Ah, but sin entered and all sin and come short of the glory of God. Some theology says that that destroyed the divine image. It said no more than the divine image there, but that's not true. I'm for all theologians that don't know what they're talking about to stop talking. <coughs> I really am. After the flood had ravaged the world, the earth was baptized with water. And the filth of it was washed away, and no one in his family was left. God said, to Whoso sheddeth man blood by man, shall his blood be shed, for man is in the image of God, even after the flood. He still bore the divine image. James said that out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. He says, a cursed man who is after the similitude of God. Paul said he agreed with the Christians. He said, we are the offspring of God. What a challenging and arresting concept. Now God has revealed himself so that he can be understood. Take an Eden. 
reveals himself now. Man falls, it looks like the human enterprise has been blasted. God turns to the devil and he preaches the gospel to the devil with the whole human race present. He can't keep it quiet. There's going to come a seed that's going to deliver a mortal bruise to your head even though you bruise his heel. Why did God say that? He wanted to be known, to be understood. There was no land of Ur of the Chaldees, a man named Abraham. This was not an ideal place to select a follower of God. It was a land riven with idolatry. And yet God found a man, Abraham. He said, this man is a man with a perfect heart. He'll walk before me and be upright and perfect. On our language, he's saying, here's a man that I can fellowship with. Here's a man I can communicate my purpose. I am going to tell Abraham what I'm going to do. I'm going to do something that will bless the whole world. Every kindred and tribe and tongue and nation, wherever humanity is found, I'll seek them out with a blessing. My intent is to bless all kindreds of the earth, and I'm going to share it with Abraham. He wanted to be known. Do you remember Enoch? That man that lived before Noah, he died at a tender age of 365. That was time that people lived to be 900, almost a thousand. So he died young. But he had this testimony before he died that he pleased God. How did he please God? He walked with God. And his walk with God is evidenced in the only words we have in Scripture that Enoch said. I must have said more than this. These words were said to a generation, a decadent generation, that had drifted away from God, a generation God was going to destroy all flesh. Here's what Enoch said. Enoch also, the seventh of Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all that are ungodly, and would convince all that are ungodly, and their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of their ungodly which they have ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now, that's a negative, negative message. But that was God's assessment of that society. Amen. Enoch had the mind of God. He Amen. walked so close to God that when he turned back and looked at the world, he, what he assessed was exactly what God had assessed. That was knowing God. He gave God's mind on the subject. Knowledge of God. He revealed himself so that he could be known. To Moses he showed his ways. Through Moses he gave a moral code that reflected his image. Defined what was right and what was wrong. Now, he didn't have to do that aside from the fact he wanted to be known. What is the knowledge of God? Well, first of all, we should say you cannot worship and serve a God you don't know. Now, a person that tries is pretending. They are not doing the truth. As the scripture would say, they lie and do not the truth. If you don't know God, you can't fellowship Him, and you can't serve Him, you can't worship Him. Not at all. The knowledge of God, from a negative viewpoint, is the dissipation of ignorance. You see, to be ignorant of God alienates you from God. Ephesians 4.18 says that the Gentile world was alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that was in them. Now, if that is true, that introduces us to a, a significant dilemma in our day. We are living when the knowledge of God is so scarce and so sparse that you can hardly find a person that knows God among religious people. God says the ignorance of God alienates people from the life of God. That is, it makes them his enemy. It makes them hostile to God. It makes them a competitor with God. So the knowledge of God is removal of that condition. The knowledge of God is intimacy with God, the likes of which the world has never seen. The Word of God tells us that he that has joined to the Lord is one spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. Now the closest of all human relationships is husband and wife. 
They two become one flesh. Think of this. He that's joined to the Lord becomes one spirit. Amen. That is to say, God's thoughts are at home in your mind. God's purposes are in perfect agreement with yours. You and God are joined together. To know God is to share his nature. We become partakers of the divine nature. 2 Peter 1 verse 4. Now that's a staggering thought. It's to partake of the divine nature, but you should not marvel at that. You are in the divine image and of his fullness have we all received and grace for grace, John says. Uh, you have a major of the stature of the fullness of Christ and knowing God is you growing up in that nature so that you reflect God's image in this capacity that you have. To know God is to understand his ways and his manners. I'm confounded on how many people are surprised when God answers their prayer. Now actually if you are such a person as that you should never stand up and testify to this because this means you're stupid. This means you're ignorant of God. You should rather say, it is the Lord. That's what holy men would say. You remember Samuel when he was just a lad? He didn't know the Lord. The scripture says, he did not know the Lord. Now Eli did. God called Samuel's name. God called his name. What do you think God could get anybody's attention? Samuel! Well, Samuel thought Eli called him. He went in and he said, here am I. He said, I didn't call him. You better go back. Call him a second time. Samuel! He went in and Eli said, it wasn't me. Third time, Eli knew. Third time's always a big time in Scripture. You trace it through. Third time, Jesus prayed. Third time, Paul prayed. Third time, God called Samuel and so forth. He said, it is the Lord. Now, the closer you get to God, the fewer the number of times he has to call your name. Now you're getting close if you can hear it the third time. It's best they only hear it one time. I can prove that to you. You remember Abraham, don't you? Abraham went up to Mount Moriah. He took Isaac up there. He's going to offer him on an altar like God told him to do. He raised that knife. The angel said, Abraham, Abraham! Boy, it's a good thing you didn't take three times. <laughs> he would have been dead. Isaac. The closer you get to God, the quicker you perceive when he's calling you. There's a song that says, when he calls me, I will answer. I like that. Another phrase of scripture that depicts the knowing of God is receiving the revelation, the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. There's nothing that clarifies the Bible like knowing God. Okay, that's right. Now there's not all kind of approaches of the scripture. Some people just uh, study about the second coming of Christ and end up with three, four, five different views of the second coming of Christ. So I feel like, said, hey, why don't we all sit at the feet of Jesus and really learn what it's about? Have a book burning. I'm for a book burning. Out there in Ephesus, you know, they had a book burning. Remember that? They burned all the books that didn't reflect the mind of God. Books of curious arts. God will show you his ways and give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. When you read the Bible, it will mean something to you. That's what you mean. He'll use the word of God. You understand this. God doesn't give private revelations to people. He doesn't do that. He opens up the scriptures to them. Jesus himself didn't give Cleopas and his friend a private revelation. He opened the Bible up. That's what he did. To know God is to be acquainted with him. Acquaint now thyself with him and be at peace. Remember Eliphaz the Temanite said that? And I can say, well, Eliphaz the Temanite, we know more about that than you do now. Amen. Acquaint now thyself with him. Are you acquainted with God? That's the knowledge, the good knowledge of God. Now quickly, what is... What happens when you know God? Well, this is what takes the grievousness out of the commandments. Mm -hmm. This is it. Word of God says, uh, uh, Hereby we know that we love him because we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Amen. That's the knowledge of God that makes them that way. If the commandments chief against a person, he's, uh, he's out of harmony with God. Now, this is what makes his yoke easy and his burden light. Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, learn from me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Well, not everybody sees that, do they? Mm -hmm. But when 
when you know God, that makes the yogi see the burden of life. This is what produces a delight in his law. I delight at the law of God after the inward man. With my mind, I myself serve the law of God. Oh, how love I the law of God. What makes that is knowing God. That's what makes it. You can't make yourself love God's law. You can't do it. It will rub you the wrong way, but you know God. Knowing God. That's what makes Jesus precious to you that believe he is precious. That's what makes you able to be guided by God's eye. Be not as the horse of the mule. That certainly needs to be shouted at. They have to be guided by a bit of the bridle. Why? Because they're recalcitrant. They're wayward. God will guide you with his eye. He said, I'll guide you with mine. Right, those are the things the knowledge of God does. Now, as we get down to this, uh, God wants to be known. The challenge that faced God was enormous. God was so great that he wanted to disseminate himself. He wanted to make himself known to personalities, to kindred personalities. So he struck upon this scheme of creating people in his image with whom he could share himself, with whom he could communicate. The great human enterprise. But Adam in the garden, Oh, what he started out, I, the times he walked with Adam. I don't know how many times it was. I don't know how long it was before Adam fell, but in the cool of the day, that must have been a joyous time. Mm -hmm. Said God came down in the cool of the day. He walked with Adam. Now, it just wasn't a casual stroll, if you understand that. There was dialogue and communication there. And after Adam sinned, God came down and God missed this. Oh, the divine lament went out. Adam! Adam, where are you? God wants to be known. It hurts God when his people's ears are dull of hearing. Amen. And when they're uncircumcised, it offends and hurts our great God. In the human undertaking, God exposed himself to unspeakable sorrow. He knew through foreknowledge what was going to occur. Mankind lift up his heel against his God, refused to have his son to reign over them. He knew all this. Now the determinist would say, or the legalist would say, or some other sophist would say, with this foreknowledge, God should probably just abandon the plan, not go forward with it at all. After all, why should he be afflicted in all their afflictions? That's what the scripture says. In all their afflictions, he was afflicted. That's what it says. Why should his heart be rent? Why should he have to be exposed to unspeakable sorrow? Just abandon the plan. Start with an angelic order. Oh, no. God continued. Why? The effort was worth the investment. To have a group of individuals that no man could number out of every kindred and tribe and tongue and nation and people with whom he could communicate was worth the inexplicable sorrow that our God endured when he undertook the human undertaking. Amen. Now, he does reveal his desire to be known in the introductory times of history. I think of Sinai when Sinai thundered and it shook and that entire Sinaitic Peninsula lit up. God's feet touched the mountain, the earth almost fell apart. Even Moses, the meekest man on all the earth, who spake face to face with God, exceedingly feared and quaked under those conditions. He uttered those commandments, those unforgettable commandments the world's never been able to forget, the Ten Commandments. The theologians have tried to erase them, tried to get them out of the schools, tried to get them out of people's thinking. They've never been able to forget what God uttered. When he began to speak them, he divulged his heart. He said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Why not? Why not have other gods? For I, the Lord, am a jealous God. I want to want to share my affection with anybody else. I'm making you for me. And I'm jealous. I'm hurt and I'm angry. When you take the fellowship that belongs to me and give it to someone else, that exposed me to God's perfect desire to be known. God addressed the human race through his holy prophets who rose up early. Jeremiah was one of them. There's a pithy statement in his book that never ceases to challenge my mind. 
He said, let not the mighty man glory in his might. And let not the rich man glory in his riches. And let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Well, this is about all the world has to offer. What are we going to glory in? What are we going to boast in? We want to be able to brag about something, to boast about something. What can we boast in, Father? But he that glories, let him glory in this, that he knows me and understands me, Amen. that I am the Lord, would exercise loving kindness in the earth, for in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Amen. Don't deprive God of any delight here. Now there are some theologians that say you can neither know nor understand God. Now you know where they're coming from. God says that's what he wants you to make your boast in. So the next time someone says, well, what good thing do you have to say? Just wear back and say, why know and understand God? And I can tell you, you will receive a variety of responses <laughs> and looks. But that is the truth. You glory. There's a lot of things I don't know. Some of them are things I could know if I wanted to. But they're not worth the effort. But I do glory. I do close that I know God and understand him. That when he speaks, it's sweet to my ears. That's like the melody of a harp. His words are found, and I did eat them, and they were found to be the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. And if men deprive me of their fellowship and deprive me of their praises, makes no difference to me. I'm looking forward to the day when every man shall have praise of God, and he will say, here's a person that knew me and understood me and uh, gave thanks to me for in these things I like, say the Lord. Don't you see the heart of God, his desire to be known? He says to the earth, look unto me and be ye saved, all ye ends of the earth. Isaiah 45, 22. God's looking for people just to look his way. Just look his way. Well, so how you look his way. Well, you take his revelation and you believe it and proceed accordingly. And you'll begin to see things that will greatly delight you. If God delights in being known, well, Jesus put it this way. These things say unto you, speak unto you, that my joy might remain in you. And that's a great, uh, great joy. Remember Ezekiel, he said, speaking for God, why will you die? Two times he asked that question. Why will you die? When God wants you to know him, why will you suffer yourself to be excluded from God? Why would the human race back off from a God that wants them to know him? <clears throat> he said to Hosea, boy, he lived in a terrible time. He said to Hosea, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings, all those bloody sacrifices of old time, that isn't what God really wanted. I know he commanded it. I know he told him to do it. But it's not really what he wanted. It's not really what he delighted in. He was just trying to accustom them to the thought that it's life for life. That if you die, if you come back to God, somebody's got to die in your place. David spoke out of Revelation when he said in burnt offerings for sin and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. He never did like them. They never did please him. But he wanted us to be known. That's what he wanted. Jesus said, I'll come, I'll come. I'll do your will. I'll go down and I'll pay the debt that has to be paid. And to whoever will listen to me, I'll open you up to them, Father. And the Father said, go. Go on the mission. That's what I want. I'll hold your hand. I'll give you the heathen for your inheritance and the uttermost part of the earth if you'll do that. Bless God, there's a train of people today that know God because Jesus has brought us to him so we can know him. Amen. 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 He showed Moses his ways. Psalm 103, showing here what it means to know God and God is God's desire to be known. He showed Moses his ways. He said unto Moses, unto the Moses he showed his ways, and unto the people his mighty acts. 
Now, here's an interesting thing. There are, in the religious circles today, a great body of people that want to see God's mighty acts. I don't get me wrong, I'm for seeing mighty acts too. But the mighty acts of God, and they are numerous in Scripture, do not have a record of impressing, of duly impressing <laughs> his creatures. <clears throat> Almost every place God has wrought mighty signs and wonders, he has been answered with rejection. Almost every single place in Scripture. Here and there, occasionally, there will be a personality that will surface and believe, but very, very rarely. No nation has ever seen the signs and wonders that Israel saw. He showed them his acts. That's what Psalm 103 is talking about. But to Moses, he showed his ways. And Israel owed their life to Moses, knowing the ways of God. Now catch the glimpse. God says to Moses, he's indignant over Israel's condition. In Exodus, the 32nd chapter, he said, Turn aside now. Stand back. Let me consume this people with my wrath, and I'll raise up of you a great nation. All right, now if that was Moses, was a legalist, he'd have said, well, now there it is. In the scriptures, God has said this. Speak to me no more. Stand aside. But Moses knew God. This was a test of Moses' faith. Moses knew God, and Moses stands up and says, no! Turn away! Turn away from your fierce wrath, God! Turn away from it! How did Moses have the audacity to ask God to turn away from what God said? He would do. He knew God. He knew the ways of God. This was out of harmony with God's nature. He said, listen, the Egyptians will hear. The Egyptians will hear. And they'll say, you brought them out to destroy them. Don't do it. Turn away from your fierce wrath. And God did. Now, God acted in harmony with his nature when he did. Now, it may be, I speak now of things that transcend the imagination, but it may be that your closeness to God and your familiarity with his ways may be the means of sparing some wayward soul. See, I know it seems too hard to believe if any man see his brother sin a sin that's not unto death and shall ask. He shall give him life in the behalf of him that asks. That was actually demonstrated in Moses. Can be in you too. God wants. We know God doesn't delight in the death of the wicked. He takes no pleasure in their death. He would that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. He'll use your acquaintance with him to effectuate some of those things. And oh, how I love this truth. He said, uh, him that, To him that feareth me, him will I show my covenant, and I will tell him my secret. It's found in Psalm 25, 14. I'll show him my covenant and tell him my secret. Now, that's a Hebrew parallelism. It is two ways of saying the same thing. His secret was his covenant. It was kept secret from the foundation of the world. But God said, listen, whoever fears me, I'll, I'll, I'll share with them what I'm going to do. And he did. He did. He told Abraham what he was going to do thousands of years before he did it. He told David. David, a man after God's own heart, he listened to him what he was going to do. I was going to raise up a king, raise up a shepherd. He told Isaiah what he was going to do. Why did these prophets receive insight into God's purpose when they sprang before the sufferings of Christ and the glory they should follow? How is it that they received those marvelous revelations? They drew close to the bosom of God. They feared him. They knew him. And he listened to them his secret and his covenant. That's our God. Amen. He wants to be known. I'll give you a heart, he said to Jeremiah, to know me. I'll give you a heart to know me. Now, the most prolific expositor of God, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ has demonstrated this truth that I'm talking about. God desires to be known. One great day of the feast, Jesus is standing on the steps. He sees the multitudes coming to the temple. He cries out, Oh, everyone that thirsteth, let him come to me. 
me. He that believeth on me, as the scripture is said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. John penned in there, this spake he of the Holy Spirit, which should after be given to them that believe. He was not yet given because Christ is not yet glorified. But he's glorified now. Amen. And Jesus Christ wants people to come to him so he can put the well inside of them. That's this well of life that comes from knowing God. You see the Apostle Paul sitting in prison? He knew God. He said, I know that this shall turn out to my salvation. He comforted himself because he knew God. See, Jesus, as he stands over Jerusalem, he wants to be known. Now, he's reflecting God's mind. He wants to be known. He said, oh, Jerusalem, wept in secret. This was not a public dissertation. By himself. Jerusalem! Thou that rejectest the prophets and stonest them that are sent to thee. How oft? How oft? How oft would I have gathered you unto myself as a hen does her brood? And you would not. No one's lost because God wants them lost. Amen. No one's ignorant of God because God wants them ignorant. He summons and calls amidst the varying sounds and summons of humanity and of demons. He summons men to come to him so that he can let himself be known to them. He said, you didn't know the day of your visitation. And you know yours. The day of your visitation. Jesus, he spoke to his disciples. There he is in the upper room. This is going to be the night of his betrayal. He says, If a man loves me, he'll keep my commandments. And I will love him. And manifest myself to him. Now there's no reason why that person can't be you. If any man love me, he'll keep my commandments. There's a lot of talk these days about unconditional love. You know, you've heard that probably in some of the songs. Unconditional love. It's not so. God's love, if you want to really get the benefit from it, is conditional. Amen. He said, if a man loves me, he'll keep my commandments, and then I'll love him. Amen. That, that means love him, not in, in a provisionary sense. God loved the whole world in a provisionary sense. But if you want the benefit from it, you've got to do something about it. Amen. And then Jesus said, if you do something about it, I'll do something about it. And I'll manifest myself to him. That's such a broad and wide subject that we'll just say, you'll love him and keep his commandments and draw nigh to him. And when you experience this revelation, when the scriptures all of a sudden are personalized to you, then you'll know it's true. He wants to be known. How about this one? He, it seems as though he sensed that the small heart of his disciples was unable to take this in. So he reiterates. He says, if a man loves me and keeps my words, my father and I, <laughs> that's a good thing, my father and I will make our abode with him. Now, when they come, they're not going to come as spectators. They're going to come as fellowshippers. Our fellowship, John said, these things I write unto you, that we might have fellowship one with another, and indeed, he says, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son. Now, it could never be if God didn't want to be known. There would be no Bible if God didn't want to be known. There would have been no law at Sinai if God didn't want to be known. There would have been no word made flesh if God didn't want to be known. There would be no gospel if God didn't want to be known. God wants to be known, to be understood. So you greatly delight in him. So your greatest joy is when you know him, fellowship him, and are in agreement with him. Nothing quite like that. Now, beloved brethren, there's two ways you can view the scriptures. I'm an ex 
expert in both of these ways. I have tried them both. You can read the Bible to find out what you should do. Now, I don't deprecate this at all, because this is the starting point. Anywhere and everywhere, whether in Scripture, whether in history, or whether in contemporary life, anyone and everyone that has drawn near to God with an honest and good heart has said, What wilt thou have me to do? Amen. This is where you start, but Amen. this isn't where you end. You start here. But soon you come to God's word and you begin to read God's word to find God's mind and God's purpose to understand and know him. That's when it begins to be proper. Now, brother, and I admonish you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to seek to know God. God has sought to know you. Know you not in that all things are naked and open before him with whom we have to do, not in that sense, but to know you in spiritual intimacy. He wants us. David one time said, Oh, how numerous are thy thoughts to me. If I should count them, I could not number them. And when I awake, I am still with thee. What was he saying? Why, God's thoughts were at home in my mind. <coughs> God wants his mind to be at home in your mind and his purpose to be one with yours. May you, as a child of God, come to know him in ever-expanding ways. Don't draw back from it. Don't attach some mystical meaning to it. Take God seriously. God has said, let him make glories, glory in this, that he knows me and understands me that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness in the earth, Amen. for in these things 